lady from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I represent Virginia's second district, which is home to Oceana Naval Air Station, very close to Norfolk Naval Base, uh, and many special forces teams and thousands of military families uh, and veterans. We know that 80 to 85 percent of new recruits have family members that are in the military. I, I'm the daughter of a Vietnam veteran as a Navy pilot married to a Navy pilot. I've got sons who are at the Naval Academy and Navy ROTC that we're very proud of. So I just want to, for a moment, speak on behalf of all military moms and dads out there. I worked very hard to be able to look both of you in the eye and just to remind you that we entrust you with our most precious possession, which is our children. So please ensure that they have the resources that they need to be able to defend our great nation. And moving on from that, just talking about quality of life issues, I know that we've talked a lot today about housing. Uh, and it's been a long and lengthy discussion, but, uh, but I support some of those issues. We need to do better with housing our military service mem members. I don't want to ask a question about it, but I just want to put, put in a plug for privatization. I know that we're budget constrained. Uh, so how can we think outside the box? Uh, we have a lot of great supporters of the military, especially in my district, who would love to be able to, to do things like provide housing. How can we use those public partner, private partnerships just to be able to, uh, to house our military, especially our enlisted men, men and women who are unaccompanied, you know, charging them for Wi-Fi and barracks. We've got three condemned barracks at NAS Oceana. This is unacceptable. Uh, moving on from that, uh, I know that Representative Whitman, who's from Virginia as well, talked today about the needs of the Navy and, and our capacity and our numbers, and he had some pretty, pretty uh, disheartening charts that he brought with him. But uh, if we have a potential war with China, we'll absolutely be a maritime conflict. And I know you've spoke about technology, but technology is only part of the answer, but it's not the answer. We certainly need to be mindful of the capacity, which includes maintaining the fleet and ship repair, which in my district is very important. I know six weeks ago, we closed four of our, our dry docks on the West Coast. We only have 22, we're down to 18. We, we, we literally closed 22% of dry docks. We now are down to one dry dock on the East Coast that can, that can repair an aircraft carrier. So this has gotta be prioritized. You know, it, God forbid we enter into a, a maritime conflict with Asia, you know, there will be damaged ships. Uh, we have no salvage capability, I know, out there. So, so what, what are you doing and what is your just prioritization of ensuring that, that our ship, ship repair industry just has the resources they need to be able to provide uh, and keep these, these old ships at sea? Well, well thank you, and, and thank you for all that you have done to support our military with your family, uh, and certainly with, uh, with your children, your husband. Um, we're investing uh, four, $4 billion in, uh, in the uh, industrial base in this budget. Uh, that includes $1.2 billion uh, for submarines uh, in, uh, in the submarine industrial base and a remainder in, uh, in SIOP, which will help improve uh, our, uh, uh, our infrastructure. Uh, we have to continue to invest in this and, and, and increase the capacity uh, and, uh, and improve the way that we're, uh, we're maintaining our ships. Uh, and, and, and get more of them to the, uh, to the operational uh, level. That's, what, that's a focus of the uh, CNO. Uh, he is absolutely focused on this, and I think hopefully we'll see some, uh, some returns on his, uh, on his investment here uh, in the near term. So. You know, last week we witnessed the 40th meeting between President Xi and President Putin over the last 10 years. President Xi's parting conversation with President Putin was explicit that their relationship is forcing change that has not occurred in nearly 100 years. We know the Sino-Russian Treaty, the 2001 Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation was reaffirmed last summer and has now been in effect for nearly 21 years. So it's clear that with Iran and North Korea providing Russia with weapons and industrial capacity to fight Ukraine, the PRC is now collaborating with Russia and I ran on technology programs, and there, there's a convergence of strategic interests among these adversaries. So I just wanted to know, you know, from your perspective, our, our strategy, our, our overarching strategy, are we looking at these aligned threats? I know we look at them individually, the threat of China, the threat of Iran, the threat of Russia, but are we look at, looking at them of more of an alignment, and, and are, we, are we practicing and, and preparing to, uh, to fight that, the, that adversary as a whole? Yeah, we... we Certainly continue to watch that to, to the point that you're making. This is very, very important and, and da potentially dangerous. Uh, we know that they have a, a relationship. We don't know, we wouldn't say that they have an alliance at this point, but this is certainly something that we'll remain focused on. So. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, General Chair.